subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button people have to live in in unity we are still in transition civil society has been decimated of course we rely on media and i think the government has not done enough the international community has failed to respond no place in the world is perfect the yoga event is held here severe injustice and they should be stopped we should raise our voices condemn this uh, brutal act Hello viewers welcome to news week south asia a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on south asian nations let's begin with the headlines first pakistan aided terrorist unleash violence in kashmir taliban attacks continue in afghanistan as peace talks progress an emergence of new terror groups posing threat to bangladesh security say reports peace in jammu and kashmir territory remains volatile due to consistent pakistan aided terror activities in the region the mass elimination of pakistani terrorists from kashmir has baffled the country and hence it has intensified its efforts to cause maximum violence in the region A large number of civilians and security personnel have already lost their lives in several terrorist attacks in the past. The terrorists launched a fresh attack in the outskirts of Srinagar this week when the Indian security personnel were on duty. A report. These sirens speak of the frustration of Pakistan, which is moving fast towards its devastation. due to its endless terror activities thousands of terrorists are being trained in its territories to unleash attacks in jammu and kashmir in the latest incident terrorists opened fire at the indian security forces when the central reserve police force troops along with jammu and kashmir police were carrying out road opening operations at pampur bypass near shrinagar two soldiers got martyred and three others were injured in the firing that subsequently led to a fierce gun battle between the two parties the jammu and kashmir police said that terrorist organization lashkar-e-taiba was involved in the attack ek bike mein do atankwadi aaye bike laga ke andhadur fire ki ak-47 se aur hamare logon ne retaliate ke usme kafi cross firing hua ye wahi lt ka terrorist hai jo pakistan se ka hai ek ka naam se fula hai a local terrorist hai these attacks in kashmir happen at the commands of islamabad whose single point agenda is to portray kashmir as a violence ridden region in front of the world they are not only meant to cause large scale damage to life and property but also to create an atmosphere of fear and terror among the people of jammu and kashmir pakistan is not having field day pakistan is so frustrated that by trying to create a disturbance and unrest in uh, jammu and kashmir it wants to show to the world that there is no peace in jammu and kashmir pakistan wants to keep jammu and kashmir problem ignited in flames that is the aim of pakistan just days after the attack indian security forces killed three terrorists in the northern shopian district of jammu and kashmir territory during an overnight ongoing encounter these recent bouts of encounters are similar to the indian army's operation all out of 2019 in which more than 160 terrorists were killed it's not just one particular corner of the region but the indian security forces have been preemptively attacking their enemies in all zones and sectors pakistan has been fighting proxy war in kashmir since decades to create unrest in the valley Pakistan is using terrorism as an instrument of state power Pakistan has been doing proxy war for many many years Pakistan knows that it is not capable of fighting indian armed forces in the battlefield it cannot face indian army in the battlefield 
so it is resorting to proxy war. Since the abrogation of Article 370 last year, the security forces are aggressively working on to eliminate the roots of terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan has already featured in the grey list of Financial Action Task Force and if it continues to finance terror outfits, the day is not far when it will be blacklisted for its support to terrorism. After the months-long deadlock of intra-Afghan negotiations, the Afghan government and the Taliban finally agreed to initiate the long-awaited peace talks in September. However, the chances of peace returning to the war-torn nation are still hanging on a thread as the two warring sides remain far apart on even the most basic issues after almost three weeks into talks meant to end the two decades of conflict. Meanwhile, Afghan civilians and security forces continue to suffer from the brunt of a high level of violence by the Taliban, a report. Taliban has not put a halt to an all-out offensive on the battleground. Dozens of Afghan security forces and civilians are being killed on a daily basis. Once again, a wave of violence left five security personnel dead and four civilians wounded in the southern province of Helmand. Earlier attackers set off a truck bomb in Afghanistan's eastern Nangarhar province, killing at least 15 people and wounding dozens as violence continues in the Warto nation despite peace talks taking place in Qatar. Negotiating teams of the Afghan government and the Taliban are still debating over the ground rules and agenda of direct peace negotiations which are widely expected to be long, complicated and grueling discussions. The Taliban want the agreement with the United States which was signed in February to serve as a pillar of future negotiations and want all issues to be resolved through a Sunni Hanafi interpretation of Islam which is one of the multiple ways of interpreting Islamic laws. But the Afghan negotiating team wishes for a more neutral approach to encompass the diversity of the country that includes Shiites and others. Afghan government has also called for an immediate ceasefire. However, analysts believe the Taliban would not agree to a comprehensive ceasefire since their ability to attack and create chaos is what gives them the leverage at the negotiation table. Uh, many forces have been on the path to restore peace in Afghanistan. It has been going on for too long, 20 years. In fact, it is uh, 2001, 9-11, when they had stepped into the Afghanistan. And uh, this is the longest period of engagement, military engagement, by the U.S. in any place. So efforts were on. And I would say that uh, if you look at critically from uh, February this year, when Doha uh, agreement was uh, done, uh, effort has been on to ensure that the peace deal is done. Meanwhile, US President Donald Trump, who campaigned on ending ridiculous endless wars in the Middle East, took to Twitter to announce that American forces currently serving in Afghanistan will be home by Christmas. It was unclear if Trump, who is seeking re-election next month, was giving an order via tweet or reiterating a long-held campaign promise in order to appeal to voters. The Taliban fighting to expel foreign forces and re-establish their Islamic state since their ouster in 2001 welcomed Trump's announcement and said it was a positive step towards a peace agreement. In a way, it is a surprise also because uh, it's an electoral time in the America. But at the same time, if you see it critically, this is not the first time that uh, U.S. President has talked about withdrawing the troops from this area. But importantly, Taliban has welcomed this tweet and they've said it's a positive step. And uh, more so if you look at it uh, since the uh, Doha agreement in February this year, uh, U.S. has already withdrawn the troops to the level of 8,600. Five bases were handed over to the uh, Afghanistan partners and all. So I would say that uh, although 
uh, it looks like that uh, the time has been expedited. But uh, at the same time, I would say that this is continuation of the same effort. As the Doha talks progress, the action in the past few days shifted out of Kabul, besides Doha to Islamabad and Delhi. Recently, Afghanistan President Ashraf Ghani visited Doha with a high-powered delegation, while Afghan peace official Abdullah Abdullah met Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi just after a three-day visit to Pakistan. Analysts say that these visits are a part of an outreach to the key countries in the region for support for the negotiations between Taliban and Afghanistan. Terrorism in all its forms continues to pose a direct threat to security and prosperity of South Asian countries and its people. Bangladesh is also facing a new wave of terrorism due to the growing influence of several international Islamist terror outfits in the country. Despite strict counter-terrorism efforts by the government, the country continues to reel from a spate of violent extremism and radicalization, leading to the revival of a number of homegrown militant organizations. We bring you a detailed report. In November 2019, an anti-terrorism court in Bangladesh handed death sentence to seven terrorists for plotting an attack on Dhaka's Holy Artisan Bakery in 2016 that killed at least 22 people in one of the worst attacks of the country. These terrorists were associated with Jamaatul Mujahideen Bangladesh, which operates under the umbrella of the global terrorist organization, the Islamic State. Amid the rising concerns of terrorism in the country, this incident prompted the government to launch massive counter-terrorism actions and wipe out Jamaatul Mujahideen and other such groups. However, the group reintroduced itself with new leadership and revamped fighting strategies and formed an ultra-radical offshoot Neo-JMB, which also refers itself as the Islamic State of Bangladesh. These terrorist outfits not only use the training and indoctrination methods of large terror organizations like Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, but have also developed stronger international links with the Islamic State. Neo Jamaatul uh, Mujahideen Bangladesh emerged in 2014 uh, in Bangladesh. Before that, uh, we had uh, Jamaatul Mujahideen Bangladesh, JMB. Uh, this was Al Qaeda allied group, but Neo JMB is Islamic State allied group. Its ideology is uh, linked to Syria uh, and it is uh, opposed to uh, democracy in Bangladesh. It wants to establish a Syria based rule in Bangladesh by uprooting democracy. This Neo JMB uh, group is using uh, sophisticated uh, weapons, unlike uh, the JMB group, which was using only bombs. Their cadres are in uh, contact with various other Islamic State inspired groups in uh, several other countries like Malaysia, Philippines and uh, several other places and they try to raise, uh, raise funds from them. Curtailing funding and money laundering for Bangladeshi terrorist groups is a significant challenge for the authorities. There are a large number of external and internal sources of terror financing which are used for recruiting and training the cadres of extremist groups like NGOs, charities and donations, self-funding, criminal activities like robbery and legitimate businesses in several sectors such as banking, healthcare, education or real estate. Meanwhile, Pakistan's notorious inter-services intelligence is also providing monetary support to train terrorist groups in Bangladesh to carry out terrorist strikes in the region and other parts of South Asia. It is a very dangerous organization for the entire uh, Southeast Asia continent. And this organization has been uh, getting funds and a lot of uh, resources from the uh, Pakistani establishment, which operates through its high commission uh, based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Recently, there has been, you know, uh, very grave uh, charges and offenses involving very high senior ranking uh, diplomats of the Pakistan embassy 
who have been caught red-handed in um, in funneling you know fake currency and well, of Indian domination and other uh, currency to these groups you know to carry out their activities of you know terror and hate according to authorities in Bangladesh Islamic State is using a network of recruiters to hire new recruits as well as social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter and Telegram to spread their doctrine among youth and establish undercover networks. Besides the Islamic State, the Rohingya crisis also remains a potent threat to Bangladesh's security and stability. Several media and intelligence reports have revealed that Pakistan's military intelligence and spy agency, the ISI, have close connections with Jamaat al-Mujahideen and other small terror groups operating at Bangladesh-Myanmar border. The report suggests that these agencies are involved in radicalizing and providing terror training to Rohingya refugees based in Bangladesh. Pakistan is basically trying to use Rohingya crisis for its own uh, advantage, as you rightly said, to advance its uh, terror agenda. However, it's a total hypocrisy. Uh, basically, it is using to advance its uh, terror agenda. Uh, they have created uh, a, one terror group called ARSA. This uh, terror group in 2017 attacked uh, a police station in Myanmar. So uh, that was the, actually the main reason behind uh, Myanmar uh, law and, uh, enforcement authorities going after these Rohingyas, which led to their exodus. Uh, after that, they also have a Huji Arakan group. Uh, this group was created by uh, Pakistan. Uh, in this group, they have recruited people, uh, Rohingya people who live in Pakistan. They send them regularly to Cox's Bazar and also to Myanmar to uh, create uh, uh, you know a law and order problem and uh, many of these uh, uh, you know uh, huji arakan people have been uh, involved in te uh, terror activities uh, and uh, it is feared that uh, this um, arakan uh, corridor uh, of rohingyas could uh, very well be turned into a jihadi corridor several pieces of evidence have time and again proved that Pakistan is providing protection, training, strategic planning, financial assistance and equipment to terrorist and insurgency groups operating in the region to destabilize neighboring Afghanistan and India. India has made efforts domestically and along with Bangladesh to counter the threat posed by Pakistan-backed terror groups. However, with terrorists adapting to exploit new technologies and new tactics, the threat of terrorism will continue to pose a big challenge to Bangladesh's peace and security. Pakistan's all-weather ally China is in military confrontation with India since April this year. Several reports suggest that after receiving strong backlash from Indian Army at the line of actual control, China is now attempting to leverage support from Pakistan-based terror outfits to create chaos and mayhem in India, a report. China for a decade blocked the listing of Jaish -e Muhammad Chief Masood Azhar as a global terrorist under the United Nations sanctions regime. China's support to Pakistani terrorists was seen as a way for Beijing to keep its hold on its all-weather ally Pakistan, a hostile neighbor to India. And now, when India and China are having a fierce face-off at eastern Ladakh sector of India, a collusion between Pakistan and China against New Delhi is being seen as the most possible Chinese game plan against India. To serve its mischievous purpose, China has now turned towards Pakistan's ununiformed army, that is, the terrorist. Along with the heavy deployment at India's eastern Ladakh sector, Reports suggest that China is also planning to use terrorism to target India and is also attempting to revive terrorist groups in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir to unleash terror against India. The Chinese supporting Pakistan-based terrorism against India is not a new thing and experts suggest that the main reason behind this support is to restrict India's growth as the most powerful Asian nation. The Chinese have always tried to use Pakistan uh, to wage battle against India. Now, this has been part of the larger Chinese design 
to use Pak to use Pakistan to fight a proxy war in India, so that India is uh, kept straight jacketed to South Asia and cannot really become an Asian power and subsequently a world power. Reportedly, the Chinese army is holding talks with Pakistan-based terror organization Al Badr to incite violence in Jammu and Kashmir. Al Badr is a defunct terror group which was born out of Hizbul Mujahideen in 1998 after the ISI encouraged terrorists to operate independently. Now China is attempting to bring it back to life while it is simultaneously urging Pakistan's secret service agency, the ISI, to send additional battle-hardened terrorists. China has supported all terrorist activities which have emanated from Pakistan. However, since last year, once the um, uh, once Article 370 was revocated, and uh, once um, the Union Territory was formed, both Pakistan and China found themselves uh, in a very, very sticky situation because peace has finally returned to the Union Territory now. And because peace has returned and because there is no violence, uh, their nefarious designs are getting nipped in the bud. They are trying to revive this terrorism again. Reportedly, the Pakistan-China Axis is also looking for a two-front attack against India. While Pakistan has moved two divisions of troops along the line of control in occupied Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan, reports also suggest that there have been a series of meetings between Chinese and Pakistani officials in recent weeks, followed by a large deployment of troops in Gilgit Baltistan. Pakistan's agenda behind the heavy deployment is to infiltrate terrorists into Jammu and Kashmir and simultaneously China could use this situation to its advantage, since an increased pressure in the valley would lead to divided attention of Indian government between Ladakh and Kashmir and hence both China and Pakistan can achieve their nefarious agendas against India. Experts, however, believe that such multifaceted planning to hurt the peace and stability of India will only fall flat at the hands of the Indian defence systems. As far as Pakistan-based terror groups are concerned, it has always been the consistent endeavour of Pakistan to push as many of these terrorists, uh, which are currently in occupied Kashmir, uh, into the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir to create trouble. Now, uh, they are also uh, uh, pushing in terrorists from Gilgit, Pakistan. What the Chinese are now thinking is, if somehow internal disturbances within the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir can be exacerbated, or if violence develops, then they will, um, they will, uh, the Indian uh, attention will actually be diverted to the valley, and uh, the pressure will ease in eastern Ladakh. There have been a number of discomforting occasions where China extended its support to Pakistan and countered India's moves to question and deter Pakistan's strategy of terrorism. And now, when China is facing problems in eastern Ladakh, where for the first time the policy of salami slicing of Indian territories has been challenged, it has once again turned to seeking help from Pakistan's strategic assets, the terrorists. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Sabijay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. <laughs>